The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Um, next, we'll move on to uh, Dave Stevenson, who's the Marvin Goldberger Professor of Planetary Science, and he's going to talk about stalking the giants. <laughs> So when I was about six years old, I was fascinated by giants. I went to the local library, read all the stories I could about giants, good giants, bad giants, selfish giants. And I suppose it's natural, therefore, that I ended up working on giant planets, <laughs> of which we have two in our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn. And uh, Jupiter just like the giant in the first slide is the 800-pound gorilla in the solar system, slings stuff around. It sends spacecraft out of the solar system, as in the uh, case that Ed Stone talked about with the Voyager spacecraft. Also sends stuff into orbits that cross the Earth, sometimes even protects the Earth. But my particular interest has to do with what goes on inside these planets. Here in a cutaway view, you see a conception of what Jupiter is like. When thinking about the inside, I am thinking perhaps in some sense about the gastroenterology of planets. <laughs> One thing we know about Jupiter is that it is mostly hydrogen. But it is not your everyday idea of hydrogen as a gas. Most of it is compressed to such high pressures by gravity that it changes its character. Hydrogen is no longer atoms or molecules, but the electrons are free to roam, and therefore it's a metal. And so most of the material within Jupiter is, in fact, in this metallic state, probably the most common planetary material in the universe, even though we don't have any of it lying around on Earth. But I want to draw your attention in particular to something at the center. Because it seems on the basis of the data we have so far, coming from gravity data, partly from spacecraft like Voyager, but also from our understanding of how materials behave at high pressure, that at the center of Jupiter there is a core. This core may only be a few percent of the mass. And so you might say, oh, that's a detail, like a pea under a mattress, a very small effect. But in fact, it turns out to be of great interest to understand why this core exists and what it might tell us. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes explaining to you the importance of cores in planets. There are two ways that you can imagine a planet developing a core. One way is bottom-up. Bottom-up means you build the planet in the form you now find it. So you build something that is at the center, and then you put stuff on top. That's the picture shown here. Another possibility is top-down. Top-down means that you just throw everything together as a mess, and you let it sit there and cook, and the heavy stuff settles out to the center. In other words, it differentiates. Both of these could end up in the same way, but they have different initial conditions. We think that what happens with giant planets is the first. We think that what is required is that you first build an embryo and then put gas on top. By contrast, in the case of Earth, the core that starts about 3,000 kilometers beneath your feet arises because the material that is in the core is, to be sure, more dense than the rocks near the surface of the Earth. But most importantly, it doesn't mix down to the atomic level. It is immiscible in the same sense that water and oil don't mix. That's the main reason that the Earth has a core. Jupiter is fundamentally different and by virtue of being fundamentally different, 
It means that the existence or absence of the core is telling us something about how the planet formed. It is a memory of the process of formation. Now, to be sure, there are other things happening in Jupiter as well. We think, in fact, that there is an emissibility in the same sense as water and oil don't mix, and that is in the form of helium. But the main effect, actually, in terms of gravity, is the possibility that there is a rocky core. And we know that that material is soluble, that is, can mix in the metallic hydrogen immediately above on the basis of quantum mechanical calculations. First principles calculations carried out at Berkeley show us that the materials that may have gone into that innermost part of Jupiter will mix into the metal, the metallic hydrogen, immediately above. And so for that reason, the core is telling us about the way the body was put together. Now, how are we going to go about deciding whether the core is there? And it's worth deciding because it can tell us something about how planets form. And indeed, Jupiter has a profound influence on the solar system. It sculpts the solar system in a very real sense. The nature of the planet we live on, Earth, and the existence of you is traceable back in terms of the sequence of events to whether or not you had a planet like Jupiter and what consequences it had. So the way we're going to figure this out, or at least make some progress on it, is through a mission called Juno. Juno is a NASA mission uh, launched in 2011. It's on its way to Jupiter right now. I was involved in the uh, writing of the proposal for this billion dollar mission. And uh, along with Andy Ingersoll, who is here in the audience, we have a major involvement in it. I am the lead for the uh, group within this mission that is going to try and figure out how to interpret the data, especially the gravity data and magnetic field data. A couple of things to point out about this spacecraft. You'll notice these things here. Those are solar panels. This is the first mission uh, to the outer solar system that is relying on sunlight rather than the radiogenic source that Ed Stone talked about in the case of Voyager or what is used on Curiosity. So that was a technological development. There's a magnetometer here. There's an instrument on this spacecraft that will measure water deep in the atmosphere of Jupiter by microwave sounding. And of course, the tracking of the spacecraft using this antenna is the means of determining gravity. This is the traditional way of getting information about the inside of a planet just by tracking the motion of the spacecraft. And the spacecraft, of course, is moving very fast, tens of kilometers per second, but we can measure the velocity of the spacecraft to an accuracy greater than the motion of the end of my forefinger. Just a millimeter per second out of tens of kilometers is measurable with precision. It was fun to go to Cape Canaveral and see the launch in 2011. And uh, this spacecraft, Juno, after being launched, headed off towards Venus and then came back to the Earth. And what you're seeing here is a sequence of images taken by the spacecraft as it approached Earth last October. And so we shot bath past the Earth in October, and now we're headed out towards Jupiter. Here's another view. This is the moon. So you can see the moon crossing the disk of the Earth. Notice, by the way, that the moon is a lot darker than the Earth. It's not obvious to the naked eye when you look up at the moon, but the moon is a lot darker than you.
So that was kind of fun. Um, of course, the reason that we did this is to get a gravity assist. So if you want to go to Jupiter, you don't head directly to Jupiter. Instead of going out, you go in, you go to Venus, and then back to the Earth. And the spacecraft will arrive at Jupiter on July 4th, 2016. Now, there's, not, there's something else that's happening, and that is that we have a spacecraft already in orbit around Saturn. That's Cassini. And the interesting thing about Cassini, assuming that NASA funds it right to the end, is that Cassini will be collecting similar kinds of information about Saturn at the same time that we're collecting information about Jupiter. The fate of both spacecraft is to crash into the planet that they're visiting. And in the period immediately before their death, they're going to be collecting data close into the planet, which is exactly what you want to do to learn about the gravity field and the magnetic field. So shown here are the orbits at the end of the mission. They're called the proximal orbits. And uh, the end of mission for Juno will be a, a year or so after the Juno spacecraft arrives at Jupiter. So that'll be in about October 2017. And the end of mission for Cassini will be in September 2017. So we're going to have this wonderful opportunity to collect information about both Jupiter and Saturn and to compare them through getting this accurate data about the gravity field and the magnetic field, and in the case of Juno, about the amount of water deep within the planet. Now, a comment about magnetic fields, this might look like something that, a, that your cat would like to play with, but it's actually a calculation of the magnetic field structure inside our planet, in the core, not in the surface of the Earth. The surface of the Earth is out here, but within the core of the Earth, and these lines represent the sense of the magnetic field, blue in, orange out. And my purpose in showing this to you is to get across the idea that when you measure magnetic fields, you learn something about the dynamics deep within the planet. And we are going to measure the magnetic field of Jupiter using the Juno spacecraft to greater accuracy than we know Earth's magnetic field in respect of that part of the field that comes from the region where the field is being generated. The difference comes about, the reason why Ju Juno can do it so well is because the field is generated out close towards the surface, but also more importantly because there are no crustal magnetic fields on a planet like Jupiter, whereas there are on the Earth. This, if you will, is weather, or certainly fluid dynamics of the deep interior. And by better understanding that and by relating it to the gravity data, we will learn not only about the question I first posed, which is the existence of core, but also learn about the dynamics, how the planet actually works. So the intent here with the Juno mission is to take these three pieces of information and figure out the nature and extent of heavy element enrichment in Jupiter's core. The gravity field, the magnetic field, the magnetometer sitting on the end of one of the uh, solar panels, and the water abundance, water abundance using the microwave sounding experiment. And of course, from that, the intent is to understand what happened when our planets formed, because, as I said, we believe that Jupiter is key to understanding that. So let me finish up then. We're trying to tame the giants. We're trying to understand how they form. We're trying to understand the existence and nature of the core. And we would also like to understand, as part of that story, as part of that formation story, the extent to which these planets moved around. For it turns out that it's quite likely 
that these planets have migrated, that the location of Jupiter right now is not the place where it formed. It may have moved in, it may have moved out, it may have done both. And of course, we would like to understand other aspects of what happened after they formed, because these planets also have their own families. They have satellite systems. These are fascinating systems in their own right. Okay, so Jupiter, four large satellites. In the case of Saturn, one large satellite, a whole bunch of small ones. And these are worlds in their own right. They have fascinating phenomenology. They have composition that tells us something about what happened when the planet formed, since the environment in which the planet formed affects the environment in which the satellites formed. We would like to understand the extent to which the core is preserved. For, as I said, the core is precarious in the sense that it will dissolve in the material above it. And of course, we would like to understand the magnetic field. And last but not least, we now have, through this extraordinary explosion of data about exoplanets, the opportunity for the first time to pose the question, how typical are our planets in the universe? We know that there are planets like Jupiter and Saturn around other stars. It would seem likely that they're not the most common kinds of planets. Those are actually an order of magnitude less massive. But planets like Jupiter and Saturn play such a crucial role in understanding the architecture of planetary systems that we can hope through making a comparison between what we have in our solar system and what we have elsewhere, that we can get an understanding of uh, what happens when planets form. And with that, I will stop. Thank you.